getting ahead of myself here. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having uh, us tonight. Again, my name is Britta Baldwin. I'm with Capital Region Watership District. I'm the division manager for our monitoring and research division. I've been with the district for 14 years now, and I've been working on Como Lake projects for the last 10. Uh, perhaps many of you were involved in the Como Lake management planning process back in 2018 and 19, um, which thank you. We really wanted to include the community in those conversations. Um, and so we've since then have taken this work and uh, are doing projects. So I'm really excited to bring you tonight uh, an outcome of that management planning process. Uh, the development of new interpretive signs for Como Lake. We really wanted to take the time to bring them to District 10 uh, because you've been such a valuable partner throughout all of our Como Lake management planning process. Um, and this is your community, this is your lake, and we want to make sure that you like what you see. <laughs> and if there's anything um, missing, we want to make sure we hear that too. So with that, well, and... I'll introduce Jessica as well, or you can introduce her. Sure. Um, so Jessica Robocamp and I oversee communications and engagement at the district. Actually, Abby, I recognize you from a previous project. Um, so I work on a lot of our communications pieces, including signage throughout the district. So this was a fun collaboration with Britta, who um, is more of the technical expert on work around the lake. Excited to share it with you all. So with that, uh, if you might have noticed, Como Lake needs new interpretive signs. Uh, what's currently out there was installed in the early 2000s. Uh, they are badly weathered, they are hard to read, and they, uh, in many cases, don't have current information on them. So it was time. Uh, so actually in that 2019, the uh, Como Lake Management Planning process, the Como community, those who participated, uh, made new signage a high priority within the plan. So within our Como Lake Management Plan, there were three recommended actions that were geared toward uh, new signage at the lake. So the first was to develop and install a kiosk that was centered around the water quality in Como Lake. The second was to develop and install new educational signage around the lake in full, and then incorporate art and other media as an alternative communication method uh, of Como Lake. In 2020, shortly after the plan was adopted, PRWD received a 319 grant from the Pollution Control Agency for a grand total of $590,760. And $85,000 of that uh, was allocated uh, to sign design, fabrication, and installation. And that those grant dollars are available through 2025. So uh, we are nearing the end of our cycle and um, working towards being this wrapped up. So we set off on the signage project uh, in 2023 and uh, put forth these goals, three goals. Uh, we wanted to create signage for Como Lake that is timeless, interesting, relevant, educational, creative, eye-catching, aesthetically pleasing, and accessible for multiple audiences. Uh, we also wanted to incorporate unique sign elements and functionalities that work to maximize their impact. Uh, for example, using QR codes or other, you know, alternative modes of access to the signs um, or information. And then we also wanted to incorporate design elements that reflect the community uh, and the local environment. Uh, in uh, spring 23, we did a request for proposals uh, seeking out a design firm to help with the sign design. And through that process, we selected background stories um, to develop unique designs and illustrations of uh, two panel kiosks and then eight interpretive signs. So 10 unique designs in total. Uh, if For those of you familiar with Willow Reserve, this is the same team that did Willow Reserve signs as well. So uh, they're familiar with uh, water resources in their area. Uh, also, as part of this project, we developed a design committee uh, that consisted of City of St. Paul Parks and Rec staff, as well as CRWD staff. 
And this group uh, helped with the design and development and draft review throughout the process. Uh, really important to include the St. Paul Parks and Rec staff since this is ultimately City St. Paul Parks property and we wanted to make sure we were all in alignment and guiding the process um, as a partnership and collaboration. Uh, we also wanted to present our final designs to three different review groups. Uh, so you, District 10, Como Community Council being one of them, but then also the CRWD the Community Advisory Committee that consists of uh, residents who live within the district boundaries, uh, as well as our board of managers. Uh, I should mention we went to our Community Advisory Committee last week, and then we'll be going to our board tomorrow. And you're tonight, obviously. <laughs> uh, so uh, when we set forth on this uh, project, we did a lot of thinking about what uh, the sign topics would include. And we largely relied on what we've heard from the community um, in the past uh, through the planning process, through community events, uh, there's a common set of questions we always get about different um, areas of interest on the lake. Uh, so that was really where we drew from to come up with this list of topics. Um, so there are eight signs that will be 26 inches by 20, and um, the topics are included there. So lakeshore, uh, food web and ecosystem, fish and fishing, uh, wildlife at the lake, rain gardens, uh, the physical history of the lake that are centered around the Dakota and their presence, past and present of the lake. Uh, we also have a two paneled kiosk um, that's one uh, that is 48, they'll each be 48 by 48 inches. And the, the first is on the lake's watershed and water quality, and then the second is on in lake processes and depth. We worked with the city to identify some preliminary locations um, with a number of considerations in mind, trying to uh, first and foremost put the sign in a relevant location where that would be, you know, the, the sign content will connect with the location you're looking at the lake. Uh, also trying to be mindful, I want to emphasize this is preliminary. Um, there are a few things have changed since this was um, math was produced, but um, also trying to space them out to kind of give some visual space between them and not, you know, pollute people's totally, you know, inundate people with information, also have them have some natural uh, sight lines. Um, and then also, you know, a number of them are existing locations and those uh, existing signs will be removed or replaced with the new ones. Um, Oh, another major consideration I mentioned is just access. We really took into consideration where people would naturally stop or if there was a really busy place where we, you wouldn't want congestion to take to occur. We avoided those types of places. Um, and then also maintenance, the lawnmowers coming around wanting to make sure there was enough room to um, get around the, the footings. So we established the design aesthetic with our design committee. Um, as well as background stories. Um, first off, we are utilizing the City of St. Paul's exterior signage design standards, and the <laughs> image in the middle is from that, that design set. We're using the CRWD color palette and typography um, that we use and, has, uh, and have developed. We are also using an inspiration uh, from woodcut illustration styles, um, like the ones you see here. These are uh, woodcut prints that were developed by Nick Robleski. He has a really great Boundary Waters prints. Um, so trying to draw in from some of the natural lines that come out from woodcuts and bringing them into the signs. Um, each of the signs, when you see them, you'll notice there's an information hierarchy with the primary illustrations you know, more built out, developed, and then sort of the secondary tertiary, they kind of get um, moved into the background. We also, Jess and I developed all the original copy um, and focusing on key messages, uh, word counts, um, trying to keep balance, you know, content with the number of words and then also plain language to make sure these are digestible, approachable, something that people are gonna want to come up and learn something from. 
All right, without further ado, um, big reveal here. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start off with our two kiosk panels. Um, and our reminder that these are quite large, so four foot by four foot. Uh, and these will be placed near to the pavilion. This image here is the original location we identified, but there's been some adjustments there um, since we established this. So it might change a little bit, but generally with near to the pavilion. All right, so this first kiosk panel is called the Watershed's Influence on Como Lake. And the purpose of the sign is to draw connections between what's happening within the watershed on the landscape and how that uh, connects to the lake and influences water quality within the lake. I should say that I'm seeing up on the screen, the colors look a little different than what um, you'll see in print. They're maybe a little more vibrant and brilliant, but um, either way, you'll kind of see up top on the landscape, um, the design, you'll see a number of pollutants that we're seeing on the landscape, and then they're connecting to our storm drains and then flushing into the lake. Um, and then showing a gradient between good and bad water quality and what the implications of those pollutants on the landscape mean. We also on the right side have a, a map showing the watershed relative to the lake so residents can connect with where they live. Um, and if they're in the watershed or not, and then how the lake is connected to the Mississippi River ultimately. And then we also offer a number of things people can do to protect the lake. Uh, and then at the bottom, you'll see there's a call out saying, how's the lake today? And um, with a link to our website where people can go and we're, we'll have, we're building out a website that'll have near real time data that's that water quality in the lake is built in. Yeah. That was just for you, Dave. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing I want to point out is kind of the layout. You're going to see this on all the signs. We have our primary header up top uh, with kind of a introductory paragraph of what, what the sign's about, introducing the topic of the sign. And then at the bottom, we have um, a number of logos as well as a QR code for translations to five different languages. Um, we have a Dakota land acknowledgment as well as the acknowledgement to the designer's background stories. Any questions, comments, or I don't, we can also save those for the end if that would be most efficient. So. My thought was when you said kiosks leading up to this was that you were gonna utilize the, there's like two empty sides on those new uh, grand round kiosks oh. that you're not doing, you're putting new kiosks in. Right, yep, there'll be new footings and there'll be standalone sign. And my second question about the picture of the kiosk, it's right where they just laid some concrete. Is that concrete for these kiosks or is no, that the bike that, racks that I'm hoping are going? So I think those are for bike racks. So that's why I say that location will change. Um, likely right next to the boat launch is what I'm thinking, but we need to work with the city because there's been a, a few changes um, that have occurred since we established the sign location. So. Okay. All right, this next sign is the other panel of the kiosk. So this is focusing on what's happening inside mm -hmm. Como Lake. So this is kind of like a peak below the surface. And will this be on the other side? Or yeah. will it be side by side? Oh, one on each side? Yes. Okay. Yep. So this, will, this one's focusing on uh, what's happening below the surface and what we don't necessarily see and how the lake functions and the relationship and importance of temperature and oxygen and how those drive a lot of the processes inside the lake and then how those change throughout the seasons. Um, so you'll see in the middle there, the primary illustration, we have uh, a transition from fall, winter, spring, and summer, and then how oxygen and temperature changes throughout those time, times, and then um, what drives those changes. And the end result in summer when we see nutrients, how that, that interacts with oxygen and temperature, aquatic plants, and then uh, what we call internal loading um, from phosphorus being released from the lake bottom. So, so it's kind of this below the surface um, processes that are really um, important in driving what we see the lake, in addition to pollutants coming in from the watershed. We also touch on aquatic invasive species, so curly pondweed and then common carp in the lake and how those influence water quality. 
Uh, at the bottom, we invite people to go to Capital Region's website and learn more about various strategies we've done to improve water quality in the lake. Um, and we'll have a number of projects highlighted there from our alum treatment to our purely fungi control, perp removal, um, and then aquatic plant transplanting and a number of these ongoing efforts that are um, we've been working on uh, since the adoption of the plan. Question, is the yeah. code right next to the EPA sign? On there, I'm having trouble seeing it, you know, just on the presentation. It's a QR code. Yes, great question. So, uh, yeah, it's a little hard to see, and these are um, kind of showing up blurry for us as well. So mm -hmm. um, that's the QR code that will lead you to translations of all the signs, and they'll go to five different languages. So yep. um, it'll be Spanish, Somali, Hmong, Karen, and then we're adding a fifth language or adding Dakota translations um, that will be available. Um, I wonder if that uh, QR code could just maybe move to the far left as like the first thing to see on there versus the, you know, that just might pull it out a little bit um, of that lower left corner, but that's just a thought. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, I'm gonna pass over to Jessica, who's gonna walk us through the interpretive science. All righty, um, so excited to move on to the interpretive science now. Uh, I'm gonna use my notes here since they're not popping up on the screen, but it's in advance. All right, so the first of the eight interpretive signs is about Como's diverse lake shore. Uh, reviews the benefits of native plantings, both for wildlife habitat and water quality. Uh, including filtering runoff, erosion control, and lake water temperature moderation. Um, it also includes a description of ongoing management activities in the lower right-hand corner, and this sign will be placed in the lakeshore area in the southwest corner of the lake. All right, uh, so next up, uh, this sign focuses on the formation of Como Lake, starting with its post-glacial period beginnings and moving on to how people have changed the lake over time. You'll notice the map of the original 120 acre lake bed uh, overlaid with its current size uh, and shape, and then descriptions of why and what happened since that time. Um, this sign will be placed near the pavilion boat docks overlooking the lake. And I should say the pavilion imagery you see on the right hand side is based on, uh, I believe the one from the 1900s. Um, and even though we don't have lily pads now, um, <laughs> we, we did have them. Um, next up, we have Homo Lake's dynamic food web and each organism's connection to one another. So starting with the migrating loon on the top, you see the top-down effect of the food web uh, begin, moving on to bigger predatory fish and down to smaller fish, and then microorganisms, including both the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. Uh, we touch on the important role of aquatic plants, as well as the implications to the ecosystem when one area of the food web becomes out of balance. This sign will be placed near a compass point on the east side. All right, next up, uh, fishing at the lake. So this sign is featuring six of the 15 fish species found at the lake and includes a ruler to measure your catch if you're a fisher person. Uh, the fish were designed with an eye towards accuracy, so visitors can use this information to help identify their catch if they catch one of these six species. And lastly, we highlighted the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources for fishing regulations and the Minnesota Department of Health for consumption guidelines, which are both questions we receive at the lake. And this sign, of course, will be near the fishing pier on the south side. All right. 
Uh, next up, uh, this sign is highlighting the diversity of wildlife that visitors might find at the lake. So from the majestic great blue heron to the red-winged blackbirds, painted turtles, muskrats, and more. This sign on the right there you can see also features the Mississippi River Flyway, noting that Como Lake provides migratory birds with an opportunity to rest and refuel on their journey. Um, this sign will be located at Compass Point, directly across from the pavilion, and is just a wonderful spot to kind of sit quietly and observe all of the wildlife. <laughs> So that's going to be at the very end of that point. And it'll be closer to the beginning. Yeah. Since the, the point floods. Yeah. All right. Um, so obviously this one's about rain gardens and how they help keep Komole clean by capturing and filtering runoff from nearby streets and parking lots. The illustrations highlight the importance of native plants um, and talk about how they provide food and habitat for wildlife and anchor the soil in place. Uh, we also invite residents to build their own rain gardens since we provide grants and technical expertise. And we'll have two rain garden signs, one by each of the rain gardens by the pavilion parking lot. All right, gonna, and then moving on, um, so two additional signs are underway that will be part of the collection once finished. Uh, both of them will focus on Dakota people, both past and present at Como Lake. And we're working with Tara Perron, also known as Blue Hummingbird Woman, to craft copy based on stories she's collected from interviewing elders and other relatives. And Thomasina Topfair, who is a local muralist, to create illustrations for these signs. Um, you get kind of a little bit of a sneak peek of some of the copy along the right hand side there. Uh, because they're still underway, we're not quite ready to show them yet, but um, we'll return with those. And these will be placed along the northwest corner of the lake. And um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So we'll, we will be working to finalize all of the draft signs in the coming weeks. Uh, and once the copy and sign design is finalized, then we move on to translations, which is a pretty big undertaking for 10 signs in five languages a piece. Those will be housed on our website. Um, sign fabrication will happen this winter. And then we'll move on to web development, that real-time data that Britta mentioned earlier. We hope to install this spring and do some sort of celebration at the lake. Um, that's also something that our Dakota contributors were really excited about. So um, that is kind of a quick high-speed overview of uh, what's been a really fun project. I'd love to hear any questions or if there's any features you liked or have questions about it, we'll be happy to entertain. Yeah, really appreciate you doing this. I always felt Minneapolis had the infrastructure edge uh, around the lakes um, and that St. Paul's signage and infrastructure was always sort of um, lacking a little bit. This was way back in my childhood, not recently, but uh, it, it's, it's great to see stuff like this. Um, do you and, and I especially love the the physical history of the lake. I, I think a lot of people don't realize the Como Golf Course used to be part of the lake, and and uh, you know Lexington Parkway, the way it curves sort of to the northwest, that follows the old lake shore. So um, it's it's great to see that. Um, couple one comment: uh, Did you have like a professional editor doing these? I noticed I'm a bit of a writing snob. After some of the sentences, you had two spaces. And then on the next sign, there was only one space, just a little nitpicky stuff like that. I'm curious, do you have an editor uh, looking these over? And um, also what happens if these get tagged with graffiti? Is, is there a plan for replacing them or, or what happens in that case? Um, well, I can do my best comment and Britta weigh in if you'd like as well. So 
a number of eyes have been on these signs in terms of the copy, but of course it's highly possible there's an extra space or something like that somewhere. So we'll continue combing these over. Um, in terms of the tagging, uh, we use a special material uh, to create them that's easier to clean up should they get tagged. It's actually the same material we've used along the green line um, on University Avenue, which those have gotten tagged and cleaned. And um, so the hope is that we're gonna be able to clean them. If we can, then we have to look at replacement. Um, but cleaning has, hasn't been too big of an issue at other signs. Yeah, it looks like the pictures of your old sign look, look like the free of graffiti. So you, you must have a system in place. That's great. Yes. <laughs> Will they just be exposed or are they going to be under like some cover, like a clear? Aren't the ground ones under something? That's like really bad. I think it's just printed on the robust material. That's, not... That's what it yeah. is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Laura? Uh, that adds on to my question is what is the estimated timeline or um, uh, lifespan of these um, signs? And is has there been any thought of also translating it into the Ojibwe language since those are the predominant um, uh, native tribes in Minnesota? Um, and languages of Ojibwe and Dakota are taught in both um, St. Paul Public Schools and Minneapolis Public Schools. I've forgotten the first question. Oh, the longevity. Oh. oh. So from a longevity perspective, uh, the hope is that these, you know, we want these to be timeless, um, but also knowing they're not going to be out there for forever. Um, you know, the hope is to have them out there for up to the next 20 years um, and the materials and uh, weathering and all that uh, should hopefully stand the test of time a little better than previous signs or the ones that are currently out there. Um, but also recognizing that information changes in this, we could revisit um, if things change in the future. But the hope is to have them out there for the next 20 years at least. Um, we wanted to not include too much dated information so that they really are stuck in 2024 or 2025 when they're installed um, so they can stand that test of time. Uh, as far as languages, um, we did not in, uh, consider Ojibwe. Um, we added Dakota uh, through working while working with our Dakota contributors, uh, and they wanted felt it was very important to include their language and having um, their language included at this special place was yeah we heard long ago that was very important so we added it in. The four others are you know the city of Saint Paul's um, five additional languages that they use. Um, the, I don't, I don't know, it's probably worth mentioning that the copywriter is both Dakota and Ojibwe, and she suggested Dakota. So I guess um, we didn't consider doing both. Um, but that's something we can think about. Especially since it's online. Um, will these uh, pictures, just like they are on the kiosks or um, uh, out in the, around the lake, will they be just like that online too through the QR code. So if someone was, um, you know, looked it up or something like that, they would see this exact same thing online somewhere. Is that the that's, exactly, that's exactly right, Laura. So everything will be translated and then they'll take the information and plug it into the designs. So the tedious part is looking through to make sure we're trying to really stay true to those designs. Yep. And also some of the more spoken languages can be significantly more cocky. So having to play with that a little bit to do our very best to, to stay true to the designs that are in English. Um, but that's the intent is that they're seeing everything. I would be seeing uh, reading it in English. Any other questions? Your fishing pier picture. 
had a picture of a walleye on it. Do you really think there's walleye in Como Lake? There's walleye in Como Lake, yep. Did you actually see one or did mm -hmm. you catch them? This yeah, is all based on actual fish surveys. We yeah. kind of looked back to see everything that's been caught and then we selected six. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and that actually brings up a good point. So all the wildlife you see on here, all the plants, everything is something you would find or see at the lake. Um, and so we we do the Watershed District versus DNR, we do extensive fish surveys. Yeah. Uh, we also look at phytoplankton species, zooplankton species. I looked at, well, and then plant surveys. So everything is all cross-checked with our data sets. And then we also, I looked, used iNaturalist to look at some more obscure species like the, um, like the, the toad and things that people, other people are seeing that might not be captured in our surveys. So just really make sure that these are authentic and true to what you would find at the lake. Was there anything there on that fishing uh, pier one that, that listed how any fish one should eat out of there uh, or frequently? Because I know that's a concern. We referenced the Minnesota Department of Health because they provide the fish consumption. We didn't want to list specific information because it varies by a person's circumstance, you know, yeah. whether you're pregnant, whether you're a kid. So we thought it would be the easiest and stand the test of time to just send them to their website for consumption. But that is definitely a question that we've got. And because consumption advisors can change too, depending on all of the environment changes. So. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the rain garden, it's sort of, but it ties into the displays which look great um so how are those rain gardens doing and is the, this year was the first year when we kind of took off and do we have an understanding of how much like runoff is being held back or mm -hmm. captured from mm -hmm. the, the those rain gardens oh i can answer that so the rain gardens are constructed at the pavilion both in the north and south parking lot um, capture 100% of the water coming off the parking lot. So um, we had a number, well, yeah, and then last summer was the first summer they were in, which unfortunately was, there's no rain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then a number of the plants that were planted didn't survive. So um, there's quite a bit of crabgrass in there. I know there are plans to do some revamping of the, the plants and then kind of rehab to, you know, it was just unfortunate with the, the rain that that happened. But this summer, then uh, they got the ultimate test with back to back to back to back to back, rainy and stew on record. And um, to my knowledge, they never overflowed into the lake. They have 100% capture. So, so there's, you know, that little bridge that goes over the overbuilt riprap that never overflowed. Oh, to my knowledge. So it's on the Oh yes, of course. <laughs> well, yeah. So I always love the wild plant, the planting to around the lake, like the Joe Pye weed and all the seems like it just be like hop over to those rain gardens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too difficult. So what what's the general condition of the lake? And, and one might you consider uh, treating it again? Uh, so the general condition of the lake, um, and I was just saying to Dan and to Chevrolet that maybe this winter I can do a full blown, all the data you could ever want to <laughs> know to see how the lake's doing. But um, in general, the, the lake is doing fantastic. Uh, last year, was 2023 was the first year at Met Water Quality um, Standards on the record. Uh, so the state shallow lake phosphorus standard is 60 micrograms per liter. We're down at 58. That is the first time in history of monitoring um, the, since 1984 we've been monitoring the lake. So of course the county has been. So anyway, that was a huge win and that was following um, several years of projects that we went to the lake from the alum treatment to the fertility mm -hmm. control. And then the biggest thing we've been working on in the last several years is getting native plants back in the lake. Um, so I think the big boost in water clarity last year was in large part because of the native aquatic plants. 
um, really taking off. And what they do is they hold phosphorus in their plant matter throughout the growing season. So um, algae can't consume it otherwise. So it's really, they're really beneficial for um, getting uh, to that high water clarity, less algae. Um, this summer, you might have noticed the water was really murky and um, a lot of, uh, we call it the turbidity, um, and that was all algal turbidity or from algae. And that was um, likely due to all the watershed runoff that came in from all the spring summer storms. Um, so, and then, in, you know, the year before, there was hardly any precipitation or a drought. And then suddenly you had all these storms flushing the landscape into the lake and we saw really high phosphorus concentrations and then subsequent algal algae blooms. So um, now in the last two months, since it hasn't been rainy, we've seen really high water clarity again, the plants are doing great. So uh, really the water, it's all to say the water really, really plays a large part and a large role in what the water quality in the lake looks like. So. Um, the alum treatment we did in 2020 is doing really well. The phosphorus concentrations of the lake bottom are really low, so that tells us that it's working and that any algae or what you're seeing with turbid water is flourishing from watershed. Mm -hmm. so, keep breaking up your leaves. New favorite fall activity. And there you go. So, <laughs> but everyone in this group does a really great job, and uh, we've been really grateful for the partnership with D10 to, to do the leaf cleanup. Excellent. Thank you both so much for that wonderful presentation. I think everybody learned a lot and it's a really great uh, great display that you're putting on. We're grateful for your uh, your work here. Oh yeah, Jessica, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to quick pop in and say, these are beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has said that yet, but they look amazing. And I'm just sitting here I literally like called my husband over. I was like, look what we get to have. So thank you so much for um the work you put into this and I'm that they're beautiful I'm absolutely in awe of them so thanks for for all of that they look great thank you thanks for saying so it's been a big project and big undertaking but really just so exciting to be at this stage and um being able to share them so and to hear that awesome. they're thank you so much Yes, thank you. Thanks for being here and thanks for sharing that all with all that information with us. We appreciate it.